Well, friends, today we're going a little deeper into the Gospel of John as we're looking at some of the miracles of Jesus there. We'll be looking at John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. And Nancy Laird is going to share that with you in a few moments. Today's message is called A Season of Miracles, Miracle of the Impossible. And we're going to talk about that word for a little bit. Before Nancy shares with you, let's pray. Guide us, O Lord, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here is Nancy. Our scripture passage for today is John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Impossible. We've all heard that word. We've all used that word. We have. It's impossible that it can snow on July 4th. It's impossible that the economy will will grow enough to flourish Indiana County here. It's, it's impossible that churches will find enough common ground to actually work together as a body of Christ. It's impossible that the pirates will win their division this year. Impossible. Yet, you and I are called frequently to do the impossible. Consider these passages uh, for a little bit. Like in Romans chapter 12, and the Apostle Paul writes this, Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Or in Luke chapter 6, when our Lord says, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Or even back in Leviticus chapter 11, I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. Those are all very legitimate commands. They are also impossible to keep. There is that word impossible yet again. So one day in the ministry of Jesus, our Lord asks a lame man to do the impossible. Pick up your mat and walk. And the man hadn't walked in 38 years. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. That was impossible. You see, Jesus had gone to Jerusalem for a feast. We're not told what feast that was. He stops by at a pool called Bethesda. Bethesda, by the way, simply means house of mercy, but it seemingly was anything but. So picture a crowd of disabled folks all hanging out around a small pool. All of them wanted one thing. They wanted healing. They were all hoping for a miracle. They weren't sure how it would happen. 
there apparently was a belief that angels occasionally stirred up the waters of the pool. And apparently it was important for the, the disabled people to get into the water while it was still moving. Hence, there is this cryptic remark when the man says, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, some, get in someone else goes down ahead of me. Anyway, Jesus is there. And if you think about it with the really, really infinite power that was available to him, he could have healed every single person. But his eyes focus on one man. A man that the Bible tells us hadn't walked in 38 years. So initially, there's a very tough lesson here. If you're really reformed and you have a little Scotch Calvinist in you, you'll understand this. God seemingly doesn't treat all people the same. He does not heal all that he could heal. Oh, he loves us all. But still, God is in charge. God is God. God will do what he wants to do. Now, we have to trust that what he wants to do is good and wise and that there's a better and wonderful plan that's probably beyond what you and I can see because we got to remember that God's ways are not our ways. God is sovereign. God is good, but he will do what he is going to do. Anyway, Jesus asks the man, do you want to be healed or do you want to get well? I think is literally what it says. And you know, that's really important question if you think about it. Some people may ask for healing, but do they really want to get well? Do they really want this? So Jesus asks this question. Do you want to get well? The man actually doesn't directly answer. Instead, he gives this comment about not being able to make it into the water at the right time because people get in the way. He can't make it without help. Understandably, our Lord ignores his comment, and instead he just barks out this command, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And it's done. You know, when you look through the witness of Scripture, you see that the healings of Jesus do not fit into a neat or predictable pattern. In one instance, the friends of a disabled man open the roof of a hut, and they lower the man down to meet Jesus, and he is healed, seemingly because of the faith of his friends. At other times, Jesus demands the faith on the part of the one who needed the healing. Think of the healing of the blind man in Matthew chapter 9. But see here, he simply commands the man to be healed. And it's not because the man believed, but because Jesus is who he is. There seem, seems to be no expectation that the man had any prior belief. And even more amazingly, as the story unfolds, we learn that this healed man is quizzed by very suspicious Jewish leaders. They want to know who it was that healed him. And guess what? When he's first confronted about this, he doesn't even know Jesus' name. From this group of people at the pool, Jesus selects a man, one particular man who had been an invalid for, what, 38 years. And he shows him that he has the power to do the impossible. Healings happen. Miracles happen. Because sometimes that's just what God chooses to do. You know, this week I received a note from a member of the church. And the note said this. We have had a miracle in our family. At a fairly young age, one of my brother's children was diagnosed with neurofibromatosis, which is a rare genetic condition that causes tumors to develop on both nerves and bones, in addition to other very serious issues. An MRI revealed an inoperable tumor on the optic nerve and indicated that blindness was probable. After many prayer petitions, six months later, the MRI showed that there was no tumor present at all. There's an indentation in the skull that proves the tumor had been present at one time, but none existed and the eyesight remained normal. We believe this is truly a miracle as there is no other explanation for this disappearance and we give God all the glory. And this person continues to live a very normal, sight-filled life. This is a miracle because, friends, miracles happen. But I want to get back to the question, do you want to get well? Well, of course, the man wanted to get well, right? 
Well, maybe yes and maybe no. Like I hinted at earlier, we just can't assume that all people want to get well. Think of the man at the pool for a moment. What if he actually made his living from his begging? If he were healed, then he'd actually have to figure out to make figure out another way to make, make a living. One that might be more physically taxing and time consuming on him. And after 38 years, what does he know to do? He might not have a clue as to how to make a living. He had also become very accustomed to having help. He attracted very likely the attention of those who would gladly offer a helping hand. And he might have actually liked that. Now healed, that help that maybe he still would need a little bit would be gone. He might have to go at it alone. You need to understand that there might have been some that would, are offered a healing touch from the divine. Some of them might just turn it down. And I know a lot of us have been challenged in various ways. We, we are. We have attitudes. We have addictions. We have bitternesses. We have angers. We have physical illnesses that disable us from being everything that the Lord would want us to be. We do. But sometimes we can actually find some comfort in those dark areas. But to you, to me, to all of us that share in this fallen human condition, Jesus asks the same question. Do you, do I, do we all want to be healed? We have our excuses. We do. We all have our versions of, I have no one help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down in front of me. So again, I've got to ask this morning, do you want to be healed? Do you? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be freed from sin's power? Do you want truly for God to intervene in your life? It's kind of a scary thing to think about sometimes. It is even for me, a pastor, a professing Christian now for almost 41 years. What's interesting is Jesus did not demand faith from the man. What he demanded actually was obedience. It's found in that simple sentence, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. The man maybe thought he had misunderstood. I mean, how could a crippled man who hasn't walked in 38 years do what seems to be impossible? Get up and walk. The man could have replied, well, wait a minute. Heal me, and then hopefully I'll walk after that. But Jesus, Jesus reversed really that order on him. Walk, and you will be healed. You have new mode of transportation. Pick up your mat, and you have a new occupation. Walk. You have a new future. And then he makes an effort to stand, and amazingly, after all, he walks. Following an impossible command. So even today, you and I hear impossible commands. We do hate what is evil, cling to what is good. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. And remember, I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. The problem is not knowing that we, the problem really is not in knowing what we've been commanded to do. The problem is, if we're honest, we don't have the strength to do it. That's true. We don't have the strength. But with Christ, he will do it. Who will do it? He will. Jesus Christ. See, God works uh, through and in us in spite of our sort of our will to overcome our resistance. He gives commands that he knows we cannot keep but he also supplies the amazing, abundant grace and power to keep them. And if there is anything, if there's anyone we can count on in this world, it is Jesus. There is so much more to think about in our reading this morning. I'm starting to run out of time with this. Uh, hopefully, if you had a chance to go back and really look at this passage... But if you look into the passage, you'll see that some of the Jewish leaders questioned the healed man because they were starting to lay a case against Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. Although the healed man really had no idea who had healed him, it's likely that the Jewish leaders had already started to get a clue. 
But then in verse 14 of the reading this morning, there is this brief confrontation between Jesus and the healed man. And Jesus sees him at the temple and says, see, you are well again. And then here comes a strange sentence. Stop sinning or something worse might happen to you. Hmm. Something worse than what he'd gone through in the past 38 years. So it would seem, although it is not expressly said, that perhaps the man's 38 years of misery was tied to some sort of sin in his life, or maybe some sort of sin had developed after he had become able to walk. I don't know. But here's the whole thing. This does not mean that everyone who commits a particular sin will be sick or handicapped or die. But sometimes, just sometimes the Bible tells us that we do reap some uh, rewards from the sin that we participate in. As the old saying goes, sometimes we do reap what we sow. Sometimes. But I think the point here, Jesus is, is warning the man of a judgment to come. Something, frankly, that's going to be far worse than the 38 years of not being able to walk. His warning here is simply his way of telling the man that he needed to repent, that he needed to turn around, that he needed to believe. Remember, there, there was no evidence when he was there at the pool that that man was a believer in any way, shape, or form. But you know what? He'd better be now. For those who don't believe, there will come a time of worse judgment. And this should be a sobering reminder to all of us as we go into the Lord's Supper in this service. What do we believe in? What do we trust? Have we been intentionally repenting of our sins? Have we been trusting the one who forgives sins and makes all things possible, including all those things that we think are impossible? So friends, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Love your enemies, do a good to those who hate you, and therefore be holy because our God is holy. <laughs> These things are impossible, yes, but with Christ, all things are possible, and that in itself is maybe the biggest miracle of all. I'm going to leave it at that right now because uh, one source of the strength of Jesus one avenue of his amazing grace is found in the Lord's Supper. The table is a representation of his place of healing, if you want to think about it that way. But the only question remains, do you want to be healed? If so, can we count on the healer to be very close to us in the next few minutes? I'm going to lead us into a time of personal confession, um, both personal but also corporate. Corporate prayer of confession will be on your screen here in just a moment. And after that, I'll leave us just a few quiet moments for all of us, including me, to just turn some things over to God right now. An opportunity to repent. An opportunity to tell Jesus, yes, 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 I want to be healed and allow this sacrament we're about to partake in to be part of the healing process. So please join me in our prayer of confession, again, that you'll see on the screen. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name. Forgive what our hearts can no longer bear. Forgive what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. Grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Now, if there's something you need to turn over to him, do so right now. You know, Isaiah 44, 22 says this, I blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me for I have redeemed you. The fact that he redeems us, my friends, again, is another great miracle. Know that you are loved, you are graced, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. 
Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and south, and sit at the table of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took bread, he blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to them. And that was the moment that their eyes opened up and they recognized him. So this, my friends, is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast which has been prepared. Let's pray. In your wisdom, you made all things. You sustain them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in the world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. We rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you. Yet you did not reject us, but you still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. In the fullness of time, out of your great love for us, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us, to heal our brokenness, to provide miracles if we want healing. And so we praise you for Jesus Christ, who was tempted in every way we are yet without sin, and who, having overcome temptation, is able to just help us in our times of trial, in our times of weakness. Grant us strength, Lord, to take up our own crosses and follow him. Therefore, we join with the voices of choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are Holy, O God of majesty. And blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He opened blind eyes. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners. And dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Raised from the grave, he won for us victory over death. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you and will come again to make all things new. So great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So my friends, let's state together the whole of the Catholic faith. And what I mean by Catholic is, is a, it's a Latin word that means universal. But this is a creed that the whole universal, the whole Catholic Church can respond to positively. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. You'll see on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of the bread and, and the cup. That the bread we break, that the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with all those who share in this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ into the world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And now we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give you thanks, Lord Jesus, that on the night of your arrest, you gathered with your friends in that upper room. And you took the bread and after you blessed it and you broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. And in the same way, you took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant sealed with my blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. And he tells us, as he told his disciples, that whenever you eat of the bread, whenever you drink of the cup, do so remembering what I have done for you. You may partake. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Thank you, Jesus, for that brokenness on our behalf. And this is his blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. Do these things remembering him. Friends, let's pray. We thank you, O oh God, that through the word and sacrament, you've given to us your son, that the one who just is the true bread of heaven, who is the food of eternal life, and we thank you for that. So strengthen us as we finish our time together. Strengthen us in your service, that our daily living may show our gratitude, show our thanks for what Jesus has done for us. And we pray these things through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, I, I hope this has been a special time for you. Uh, we're done sharing this time together. But again, I, I would encourage you to take this with you. Remember, not just during this time, but in anything that God has for you the rest of this day, the rest of the week, that Jesus' body was broken for you. It was. And that his blood was shed so we could live in grace. So that our sins could be forgiven. And that is the ultimate healing that we all can have. And so as you go about whatever God has for you to do, may you be on your guard. May you stand firm in the faith. May you be a person of courage. And may God grant you strength. But above all, May everything you and I do be done in the name and the love and the healing and the miracles of Jesus Christ. Do you want to be healed? Do you? It's available, my friends. Amen. And God bless you.